Come Holy Spirit, come fill my heart, refresh my soul. This is your season of grace come with your host, Spirit, Patrick Henry Eden. Get ready for Grace Revolution. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and I am helped. My heart lifts for joy and I will give thanks to Him in song. The Lord is the strength of His people, a fortress of salvation for His anointed one. Glory to God. Say, so The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the strength. Stand up and let's read this verse together. Make it personal. So the Lord, let's go. The Lord is the strength of his people. A fortress of salvation for his anointed one. So Father, we thank you. At the beginning you spoke stars came forth the moon appeared and the sun shone this is the beginning again for another person's destiny so as you speak through me for i allow myself to be an empty shell that you will speak through and your voice will boom and kingdoms will fall and then the stars of somebody will shine. Yeah. And the moon will be in place and the sun will rise. Yeah. And there will be day and there will be night. Yeah. The first day, the second, and the glorious day. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. David talks a lot about fortress. If you read through the Psalms of the David, the singing of David, whether it is in second Samuel or it is in the psalm, like I'm eating all this particular psalm. There's a lot of my strength, my horn, my fortress, my refuse, my shield. David uses this word. This word. The reason is because David was a warrior. If you're a warrior, you will understand matters of fortress. You will understand issues of shield. You will understand the issues of strength. Warfare speaks to strength and, and demands strength. When war is going on, it is not beauty that is required. In the time of war, it is not how your face looks like. It is not your eyelash. It is your strength. So when David is saying, the Lord is my strength, this guy was a warrior. This guy had personal experience, near-death experiences. Saul attempted severally to pin him to the wall with a javelin. The Lord shielded him. Saul made it a personal duty. Saul said, I know I will lose the kingdom, but before I lose the kingdom, let me lose you. Let me see you die. The Lord shielded him. And David writes his song. The word Sam is from the Hebrew word Samu. Samu is him. All the Psalms were hymns inspired by the moods, the disposition of either the nation, the community, or an individual, a family. personal accounts of people's lives. So David talks a lot about fortress. First of all, I just had to introduce, talking about fortress from the point of view of David, this man needed the fortress. And he knew that only God would provide fortress, provide fortification. So a fortress is an inaccessible place. You can enter a building you walk around everywhere. There are some places you don't enter. 
is a fortified area, inaccessible. It is, place, it is a place of power. In that place, somebody sees you, but you don't see the person. That means if somebody there wants to harm you, he does it before you know it. And if you are looking to, or for opportunity to harm the person, you look for it in vain, you will not. Why? The place is inaccessible. It's not open to you. That is fortress. Fortress is not necessarily a physical thing beyond the physical fortress. The real fortress is spiritual fortress. Inaccessible. That is what Psalm 91 talks about. Put Psalm 91 verse 1 on the screen. We are still doing introduction. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow. If you dwell there, you will rest there. Tell somebody, if you dwell there, where? Where? In the shelter of the Most High, then you will do what? You will rest. So there is rest for those who dwell the shelter of the Most High is not church. As beautiful as a temple was, that was not the shelter of the Most High. That's why God permitted the temple of Jerusalem to be pulled down and be destroyed. The shelter of God cannot be pulled down. The shelter of God is God himself. The presence of God. The presence. And when you are in the presence of God, you are inaccessible to the forces of darkness. If you dwell in the place of the Most High, in the environment of God, if you dwell in His sacred place, in His presence, you are inaccessible to chance, to arrows. A preacher stands like this. All the arrows against you is directed against you. And so when somebody carries this microphone, some people, they, there are certain things they cannot say because they are not too sure. They play safe. But to take the microphone and say everything, including everything and anything, with absolute confidence, it means you are ready for the arrows. Because everything that hates you, hates the one who carries your help. So, as a minister of the gospel, if you don't dwell in the presence of the Most High, you can finish preaching and you carry the consequence, you never preach again, you die. You have to dwell there before you can rest there. In marriage, in relationship, in finance, you can keep your finance in the inaccessible place of God. Storms will rise, they don't touch. You can keep your marriage in the inaccessible place. Storm will rise, but you stand. It matters where you dwell. Because you will always rest where you dwell. If you dwell in darkness, you rest there. <laughs> oh, today, God is bringing you to his secret place. Yeah. I pray in the name of Jesus that by the administration of grace, God will pull you into the secret place. Yeah. And I warn you, don't be deceived. It's not about the church you go to. It's about the God you serve. Don't let anybody lie to you. That if you come here, that here can give you coverage if you don't know God. The relevance of a place is in showing you the place of God. And then you enter. That's the relevance of a man of God or a woman of God or the place of, of the gospel. For we are pointers. We are messengers. We, don't, we are not the one. John, people went to John. I see, are you the one? You say, I'm not. Who are you then? I'm a voice. A voice that speaks in the desert. Prepare a way. That's the messenger. That's who we are. We're voices. God needs this voice for somebody to run into the place of the Mosai. Tonight you will run. Glory to God. I'm talking about in inaccessible place. That's the fortress. It's a spiritual environment. It's a quality of your life. It's where you live. Fortress gives you advantage. When you live in the inaccessible place of destiny and life, 
you have advantage over adversity. You have advantage over the adversary. One comes against you, but the Holy Ghost raises the banner. And you are shielded. That's where confidence comes from. That's where confidence, that's where boldness comes from. The scripture says in Jeremiah, let the one who boasts not boast of his horses. Let him not boast of his wisdom. Let him boast of the fact that he knows the Lord. If you know him as a secret place, you can tell death where is your sting. You can tell sickness where is your power. The spirit of death can come against you. You harass harassment. As I'm speaking to you, something is leaving you. Yeah. Something that kept you lame is leaving you. Yeah. As, as I'm speaking, something is walking out of your body. Yeah. Every strange beam, every strange shadow that possessed you and kept you in fear, that shadow is walking out of you in the name of Jesus. As I'm talking, a shadow of sickness. Something you have been calling my own. A shadow that looks like you, but it's not you. It is going. Lift up your two hands. Every shadow of deception. Go, 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 go in the name of Jesus Christ. That shadow is a lie. It looks like you, but it's not you. Shh. Do you know what? Look at me. Can you see that? That's a shadow, but that's not me. But it looks like me. That is what keeps a lot of people saying my problem. That's my issue. God asked me to come and tell you, don't say my problem, say a problem. Don't say my sickness, say sickness. Detach yourself from it. Because it is a shadow and it is not you. That shadow is leaving you. Walk around and say, the shadow has left me. The shadow has left me. The shadow has left me. That shadow of infirmity has left. That shadow of barrenness has left. That shadow of evil luck. That shadow of frustration and limitation. That shadow has left you cannot go far in life, in the life of advantage. Because advantage is what places you ahead. Advantage is what makes you higher than the competition, higher than what bring, also brings you down. Advantage makes you confident. Advantage makes you bold. Advantage makes you rest. Advantage takes you away from stress. When you know you have advantage, for example, examination is coming. And you know the questions through and through it gives you advantage is it not true so when you sit down you know the end from the beginning advantage gives you victory before the fight you already know so when a child of god is meeting issues the fact that he lives in the inaccessible place of god in the fortress of god he has an advantage he knows how the end will be the end of the fight is that i'm going to bring you down so you go into spiritual warfare, not trying to try to see what will happen. I come to knock you down. And I tell you what the end will be from the beginning. You cannot go far until you deal with the issue of the fortress of the enemy. As long as the enemy has a fortress, it means you are not safe. Why? Because fortress gives protection to the enemy. The fortress makes your enemy inaccessible. It tears you down, but you don't know where he comes from. You don't know what to do with him. You don't know how to deal with him. That is what makes an enemy dangerous. An enemy that you know how to deal with, you know where he's coming from, how you pray. It cannot harm you much. But the enemy you know where he's operating from, what gives him strength, what protects him, that is the enemy you should fear. And it is the fortress that makes such an enemy dangerous. That is why the most destructive enemy is the close, harmless, innocent enemy. An enemy that is so close, 
and apparently so harmless and obviously so innocent. The enemy of a mother who sits with the daughter in the hospital to cry every day, yet she's responsible for the sickness. The enemy of a father who takes the son to wherever the son can be delivered and yet is responsible for the bondage. The enemy of the one who cries, who is the first person to cry when something happens and is the first person to look for help when there is need. That one is the real enemy. Not the one that doesn't greet you, that one you already know now. The one that tells you I will kill you, you already know now. <laughs> That's why you need to understand the working of fortress. If you understand me, say, I understand you. I pray for the spirit of revelation over you. Glory to God. Second Samuel, chapter 5, verses 6, 7. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. They were confident. Even the blind and the lame can walk you off. They were confident. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. David was going against a fortress. It takes liver and courage to go against the fortress. The fortress is terrifying. It's intimidating. That's why too many people are not fortified and protected because they cannot dare the fortress. You see, the enemy, the devil, is not afraid of the fortress. The enemy, when he comes to a place like this, he tries to find out where the strength is. And he tries to get involved in the strength. To turn the strength into weakness. Because where your strength is, that's your fortress. And the enemy knows in order to harm you, he has to first of all destroy your strength. That's why if your wife is your strength, the first attack of the enemy is to break either your wife in health or break your relationship with your wife. Shh, I'm, I'm sharing secret. When your strength is in a particular place or a person that is the the place the focal point of attack because once your fortress is dismantled then you are taken captive like a dog lift up your two hands it's in the name of jesus christ i will take the fortress of the enemy and i will take possession of the stronghold of the enemy now, they see that, see, the enemy targets your fortress. That means for you to overcome your enemy, you have to identify the fortress of your enemy. Because if, if you don't do, you will do. If you don't destroy the fortress of your enemy, your, the enemy will destroy your fortress. Whoever destroys the fortress takes advantage, has the upper hand. So at the end of it, battles are reduced to taking over somebody else's fortress. David went against the Jebusite in their mount, the fortress. As soon as he took it, that was the end of it. But the Jebusite were so confident he would not take because that was their stronghold. Don't stay in your stronghold and think something cannot happen. Be careful. Let me ask you something. Where do you think is the location of the fortress of the enemy? Can somebody help me? Okay. Sin. You know, sometimes what we fear most is a shrine. You see, that's a shrine of the devil. So don't go there. Or let us go there and pull down that shrine. Therefore, we are far. The greatest stronghold of the devil is not out there. But us. What gives the enemy advantage over you is not far from you. The greatest fortress. That the enemy can use to ruin you and destroy you and have upper hand and keep you a beggar forever. It's not out there. It's close to you. Sometimes it's in you. The enemy does not build a fortress out there far away from you. He builds a fortress in you. 
and around you. Let me share a few things with you. Psalm 60, verse 7 to 10. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet, Judah my scepter, Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom, I, just, I toss my sandal. Over Philistia, I shout in triumph, Who will bring me to the fortified city? That means, who will bring me to the fortress? This is a song of war. Who will take me to where the enemy has advantage? That's what it means. Who will take me to where the enemy is hiding to operate against me? Who will take me to this, the inaccessible place of my enemy? Hear the response. He said, who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O oh God? Is it not you? You who have rejected us and no longer go out with our armies. It means it's only God who can reveal to you the fortress of the enemy against you. Flesh and blood cannot reveal to you the advantage of the enemy. I ask tonight that God will show you their secret. That's what the scripture is saying here. Who will take me face to face? Who will take me to the fortified place? To the place that is inaccessible to the eyes and to the senses. And the writer says, is it not you God? Who else can reveal the secret of the evil one? Who else can reveal what gives the enemy an advantage over me? Is it not you, God? Because flesh and blood cannot access it. Is it not you? I speak the spirit of revelation upon you. Yeah. Stand up and lift up your two hands and say, I receive the spirit of revelation. No, say it again. I say, I receive the spirit of revelation. In the name of Jesus Christ. Be seated. Your eyes will be open to see what gives you, what gives the enemy advantage over you. Yeah. I say your eyes will be open. Yeah. So that you will see what gives the enemy advantage over you. That's what that scripture says. At all times you need to know, that's why don't joke with God one second. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25-27. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. What did he say? In your anger, do not sin. The scripture doesn't say don't be angry. It says, but in your anger. Some people say, you cannot be angry now. You are a man of God. Say, shut up. You don't change anything until you are angry. Nothing changes until you are angry. Anger is a fear for change. God gets angry. What makes the difference is what do you do with your anger? What makes you angry? And what do you do with it? Without anger, you cannot change abusive relationship. Somebody who constantly abuses you until you get angry, you will not recognize that it is time to stop. Am I talking to somebody? There is a place for anger. There's a time you get angry with somebody and you wake up in the morning and still greet the person. He doesn't want to greet. I say, I am come on. You will greet me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going to be in that place you are taking me to. I'm not talking. I'm talking to you. I love you. <laughs> somebody tries to be an enemy. You say, it's, not a, it's a lie. I will never be your enemy. You know, some people want to blackmail you. When it's time to be angry, be angry. Anger brings change what you are not angry about you cannot change what you are angry about you are likely to change am I talking to somebody a school of wisdom he said in your anger do not sin the next one said do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold where do not give the devil a foothold in your life a fortress. A foothold is where the devil will stand to operate. And that is a fortress. That means every day, everywhere, people are creating fortresses for the evil one to operate. 
while they are praying, they say, say in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, every evil altar, every evil altar that is against me, they pull you down, pull you down. And they are thinking of one altar in the village. Oh, there is one altar here. And the evil one, they take over. He said, the way you give it better. You know what lasts. The greatest change is not what changes out there. It's what changes in here. Still. If you want to clap for Jesus, if it is Jesus, go ahead and clap. The greatest change is not what changes out there. It's what changes in here. And so while you are looking for the, for the stronghold, the fortress of the enemy, out there to pull down, God's intention is that you may see the full hole you have created. I'm going to share with you a few things. Glory to God. By the way, everything in your life, in any way, you have handed the footstool, the fortress to the enemy to destroy your life. Tonight, by the administration of grace, I command it to expire. Yeah. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I let go everything in me around me about me that gives the enemy advantage over my life pray that prayer for 30 seconds and let it go and let it go whatever it is that gives the enemy advantage over my life. I let it go. Whatever that empowers Satan over me, I let it go. Whatever it is, whatever it is, I let it go. Every relationship, I let it go. Every connection, I let it go. Every influence, I let it go. In the name of Jesus. Tonight, everything that gives the enemy advantage over you has expired in the name of Jesus Christ. I say it has expired. Whatever, no matter how much you love it. We are talking about a life of victory. The enemy prospers if fell but she was the one who ate the fruit it's not somebody else it's not an enemy that ate it the enemy uses you against you that's the greatest art of warfare the greatest dimension in warfare strategy is to use your strength against you to turn you against you your strength fighting against you. Imagine your husband being against you or your wife being against you. Your children rising against you. Your boss rising against you. The one that should help you now standing against you. That's what the enemy does. Eve was the one who ate the fruit, not an enemy. So that the, the devil will say, ah, what did I do? She ate it now. I'm not the one who ate it. Receive wisdom. Yeah. Say, I receive revelation. I will not be used against me. I pray in the name of Jesus, your wife will not be used against you. I pray in the name of Jesus, your husband will not be used against you. I pray in the name of Jesus, your helper will not be used against you. I pray in the name of Jesus, your sister, your brother will not be used against you. Let's share a few things what the enemy uses to have advantage over people. Number one, personal weakness. Personal weakness. Give attention to weakness. <laughs> Every weakness you tolerate is an acceptance of death. Every weakness you tolerate is an agreement to die early. You write it down. 
A decision to tolerate personal weakness is also a decision to die before time. Personal weakness is a fortified, inaccessible place where the enemy dwells to destroy the mighty. David is a man that is presented as extraordinary. From the time David is introduced in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 16 up to 2 Samuel chapter 10, David is invincible, untouchable. David wins in every battle. David lives in an, in an inaccessible place. Just one day. The weakness of David. The scripture says in 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 1. In the springs at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites, the Ammonites, and besieged Rabbah. But David remained. He remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. The problem was not the beauty of the woman. The beauty of the woman revealed the weakness of the man. Don't accuse a woman of being beautiful. It is God's work. Accuse your disposition of lawlessness towards beautiful women. <laughs> Absolutely. The problem is not that beautiful person. Watch your heart. Watch, your heart is the demon, not that woman. A beautiful woman is just a beautiful woman. There are very many demonic agents that are not beautiful. They are not beautiful at all, but they are very effective. Yeah, because sometimes in a holiness tradition of Christianity, making beauty look like we have to suspect when somebody dresses well and elegant and presentable, that's carnality. It's a lie. Get out. Check your heart. Hypocrisy. You have to train your heart to hold it. Hold your ground. Say what God says and do what God does. So David saw but what he saw revealed his weakness. And that instance, from that chapter till the end of David's life, things were never the same. It was a matter of few chapters. The son killed, uh, the, the, the son raped the daughter, and the other son killed the son. Eventually, the son rose against the father, drove the father away. The stronghold, the fortification of the enemy was the weakness of the man. Watch weakness. Say, that's my problem. This time I get angry. I feel like breaking things. That's my own problem. It is a problem. Don't call it your problem. Remember the shadow? The shadow is not you. Deal with it as a shadow. Let it go. Don't take ownership of problem. Deal with it. What you take ownership of, you own, you keep. But what you deal with, you let go. Did I say something? What you own, you keep. You are likely to keep what you own. But what you deal with, you are likely to dispense. Let it go. Tell somebody, let it go. Some people will say, each time I get close to marriage and something will just happen. What is it that happened? Find out. Don't, before you accuse the devil, find out what stronghold is helping the enemy to be effective. There are too many people who come, they blame the devil, they go for him, man. What stronghold is making the devil effective? Could it be arrogance? That's the stronghold. That's the fortification. That's the fortress. Whereas we are busy pulling down the fortress of the enemy out there, an arrogant person is still arrogant. Deal with it. Tell somebody, deal with it. Personal weakness. 
a man that is married but wants to have every other person as a second wife. It's weakness. Yeah, you say God knows, you know, God, God knows my weakness. God knows your weakness will kill you. Except that you don't know. God knows. But you say God knows. He knows that's my weakness. Yeah, God also knows that your weakness is the most effective way of the enemy destroying you. He knows that one. Ask God, God will tell you. That there is a way that seemeth right. But at the end, it leads to destruction. God knows it. Don't own weakness. Deal with weakness. Write down weakness. Identify weakness. Deal with weakness. As a mother, as a father, raise up your children to be self-aware. Draw their attention early to their flaws. Let their children, let your children be aware. You see, the way we raise children now, they are ignorant of their weaknesses. Why? We shield them from correction. Maybe a cousin, maybe a nanny. What? Leave, leave my little girl. Leave, don't talk. I'll slap you. How dare you touch my girl? That girl has become colorblind to weakness. That is what may keep that girl a manager in the greatest bank, but a terrorist in a man's house. Draw the attention of your children to their weakness and do it early. And confront it and make them to confront it at every stage because what you don't deal with today will become compounded tomorrow that's the law of mathematics any problem in mathematics you cannot face today by the time you go to the next chapter it will bring X upon his head I don't know whether I'm the only one who knows it the problem you don't deal with now will get compounded tomorrow. As a matter of principle, you can never run away from problem. You deal with problem. The second thing, greed. Okay, we talk about the greed. Satan had advantage over Judas because of personal weakness, greed. That of David was lost. Greed. You see somebody's thing, you feel like if you don't have it, you will die. You came to church with the best shoe, only for you to see another person with a better shoe. And from that moment, all the trust and obey, you didn't hear it again. All the preaching, you are so angry, you are plotting how to get that shoe. Because of that, the way you carry your face, your husband cannot even ask you for food. Because you saw shoes that were better than your own. Greed. Before you know it, there is one politician that is ready to give you that show. And you say, workplace, I send you on a seminar to Lagos. And you disappear. Because you want to afford shoes that are better than that of everyone in the church. John's Gospel chapter 12 from verse 1 to 6. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold? And the money given to the poor, it was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money back, he used to help himself to what was put into it. You understand it? The second thing that the devil uses as, an, as a fortification, fortress to destroy ignorance. Ignorance is more destructive than witches and wizard combined. And it hurts to see how, many, how people hate knowledge. We just love empty prayer and sweating. But knowledge 
reading books, reading the Bible, understanding, buying CDs, investing time, sitting down to receive revelation, take down notes, review, understand, grow in it. No. Until you make a covenant with knowledge, you cannot deal successfully with the enemy. In business, until you know more than what your, the competitor knows, you cannot go anywhere. Business is no longer hard work. Business is knowledge base. We have transitioned from information age to knowledge base. The advent of computer, we talk about information, information, information. Now, it's no longer about information. It's about what to do with information, knowledge. There are guys who are small, girls who are little. They do nothing. They just sit down and consult. What they do is that they give knowledge. They train. They say something. And people use it and run and get results. Those are people who make the money of the world right now. Those who have knowledge. Knowledge is everything. We moved from the stone age or whatever age, agricultural age of uh, tools, from the gathering age of just plucking fruit to the, the man who will plant and use tools. We came to the industrial age of inventing machines where hard labor, people toiling in the factory, doing that was a great thing. And we moved from that age to the information age, computer age of people now. It is now knowledge. And we are going to the, towards the age of wisdom. <laughs> the next step is going to be the age of wisdom. That is no longer about knowing. It is at the apex of knowledge, the synthesization, the synthesis, and the application of knowledge at the most cutting edge level that gives you advantage. Knowledge gives you advantage. Knowledge gives you, gives you a direction that in the eyes of the ignorant, it thinks you are dying. But tomorrow he knows, if I had known, I would have entered this path with you. Receive knowledge. Receive the spirit of knowledge. Look at what the scripture says about knowledge. Hosea chapter 4, from verse 6 to 8. My people are be destroyed from lack of what? knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. It's not uniform. It's nothing. It's knowledge. Knowledge. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Just guys didn't say the oil will set you free. He said then you will know the truth. And then the truth will set you free. Deliverance is so simple. If you know the truth. The greatest oppression in deliverance is not somebody touching you. Instantly when you know the truth, something lets you go. Instantly. When you have discovered the code of wealth, poverty dies. If you discover the knowledge about healing, sickness disappears. If you know the cure to fear, fear dies. 98% or 95% of humanity lives under fear. Religion, they pray because of fear. People go to church, feel the church on Sunday. Most people not because they want God, they want is fear. Lift up and say, every oppression of fear in my life, by the oppression of grace and mercy, I am free. Speak it, speak it out, speak it out. I am free from fear. I am free from fear. I am free from fear. In the name of Jesus Christ. You see, ignorance brings about fear. Knowledge drives away fear. Our ancestors, every sickness that could not be dealt with, they could not know anything about, they say is fought spirits. Apawen. Stroke, you know, most of the time it's about the blood pressure and all that. One can you need to do to do if you have anything that is stroke, that means somebody threw through it. It took it, 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 
am ya pom inu hanam zongpo kwang ignorance whereas knowledge will make you exercise live healthy keep a normal weight moderate weight and eat healthy and move your body exercise and keep your arteries flowing and your blood pumping and your health normal no because you don't know and you live a life that is not okay eating all the wrong things and drinking all the old and eventually what something happens that means that your brother who said the other day i am good he said, now, what is it? Whatever you predicted has happened. Now, you know, yes, sir. You have given him poison. He eats and dies in ignorance. We need all the knowledge. This program is sponsored by the Covenant Friends and Partners of Grace Family Global Outreach. You can be part of this grace revolution by becoming a covenant partner today. Allow God to use you. Our account details are as follows. Bank, Zenith Bank. Account name, Grace Family Global Outreach. Account number, 101-42-1978-63. For inquiries, please call 81 804 33225 or 090-738-38742. To all our covenant partners and friends, we say thank you. Like the widow of Zarephath, your oil will never run dry. To order for the books, messages, and other resource materials, please call or send an SMS to 080 46346 or 081-804-33225 Videos are also available on YouTube at outreach To stay connected, like us on Facebook at Grace Family Outreach or visit our website at www.gracecommission.org